About uh, 60 years ago, I was only uh, nine or 10 roughly, and uh, my best mate, Andrew, who was, uh, lived next door, and I would walk down to the local uh, Anglican uh, uh, church, St Oswald's, and uh, believe it or not, Father Brown was the uh, pastor there. And, um, and then every week, uh, Mr and Mrs Atkins, uh, an older couple, would arrive in their black Bentley, it was a beautiful car, and uh, park outside church and take us for Sunday school. And every Sunday for a couple of years, we would say the Lord's Prayer, Psalm 95, and the Apostles' Creed. And uh, 60 years later, I can more or less still say the Apostles' Creed. It just shows you how sometimes we, we worry about uh, rote learning in a sense, but there is a sense in which it's a beautiful thing to know the Lord's Prayer, to have memorised the Lord's Prayer and Psalm 95 and, and the Apostles' Creed. And I don't know whether Mr and Mrs Atkins ever had kids, but they did a beautiful thing in many of our lives, the way they taught us these things. And never think that investing your time in nine-year-olds is a waste of time. It, so much more goes in than you think. But the Apostles' Creed, um, you may have never come across it. I, I spoke with someone who had no idea what it was during the week. And um, over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, three creeds. Today, the Apostles' Creed, and then next week, the Nicene Creed, and then the Athanasius uh, Creed. That one's a little bit hard to pronounce, but uh, a fellow called Athanasius fought for years for the truth of, uh, of the word, the doctrine. But in, in case you're worried, we're, we're not about to become an Anglican uh, church. But there is a sense in which we do need to know something of the history of the church. We belong to a body that is, it, it's not just about today, it's not just about city light. It, it's, you look back, it's, it's like 2,000 years. And so the Apostle Creed has been part of that church life since probably about 180, 190 in, in various forms and sort of got modified a bit, but that's, it's been around as part of church life for uh, you know, getting on to 2,000 years. And when we think about traditions, sometimes we can have a, a bit of a wrong view. You know, when Jesus came, there was a lot of religious tradition, and Jesus had to say, you know, you've abandoned the command of God and you hold on to human tradition in Mark 7. And, and there are some traditions that are not always helpful in terms of our relationship with God. But there is a, a positive side of tradition. In, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, you know, Paul says to the church, hold fast to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. In, in 2 Thessalonians 2, hold on to the traditions you were taught, the solid, basic uh, teaching. And, uh, and Paul, when he's talking with the Ephesian uh, elders, he says, you've got to be on the alert because people will rise up, even from your own number after I'm gone, and they will distort the truth. And it's not like very rarely, if ever, would we get someone coming into church here and saying, oh, well, Jesus never existed. It's more a distortion. He wasn't really fully God or he wasn't really human or, or the Holy Spirit. You know, so much teaching gets distorted. And that's why, in a sense, we need a creeds. Creeds are like, you know, from the earliest days, the church develop these creeds they're like short simple summaries I mean today sometimes and I know they can be pretty boring you can have these PowerPoint uh, summary presentations well a creed is really like a summary of what we believe and saying the creed together in a sense binds us together this is not only what I believe personally 
but what we believe as a gathering of the people of God. So you've got your little card there. We're going to uh, read it together. I had to uh, maximise the font size for the older people so that they could uh, say, so that I could see it. Um, and there's a bit of smaller font on the back. I'll tell you about that afterwards. But uh, let's, let's, read it, uh, let's read it all together out loud. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. So we say that together because this is what we believe together. And overarching, you'll see, is the Trinity. God the Father who made us, the Son who came to save us, the Holy Spirit who makes us holy and brings us together as one body. But see how we start with I believe. The Christian life is a life of faith. It's, it's what we believe in. And, and God says in Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who seek him. And, and sometimes you can talk with people and the idea of faith or Christianity comes up and people will say, oh yeah, I believe, I, I believe. But in my thinking, believe what? You know, because Christian faith is not just I believe. Christian faith, the Bible, the, the faith that the Bible talks about is belief in God, belief in Jesus, belief in what Jesus has done for me, in belief in his word, in his promises. And, uh, and James says that just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. When we say, I believe, it's not just to be an intellectual thing. It's, it's to be something that affects my whole life, mind, emotions, will, my whole life. So when we say the Apostles' Creed, God longs that this isn't just words, but it's something that's, that starts to affect the very way I live. This is his command, he says in 1 John 3, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. So I believe in God, the Father Almighty. You know, people have many different ideas about God. And part of the creeds, as they developed over the years, was really to address distortions of who God is and who he's not. And, uh, and so the Apostles' Creed is going right back to the very early days. But we believe in God, the Father Almighty. When Moses was called by God to take the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, he says, if I go to the Israelites in Exodus 3 and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? And God replies to Moses, I am who I am, or I am because I am. I will be who I will be. I am the ultimate personal reality in the whole universe. And, and our reaction, it has to be far more than intellectual. When God comes down in a cloud to Moses and says, I am the Lord, a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth. Moses immediately knelt low on the ground and worshipped. 
And as we come in our hearts to say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, it should make us worship him and bow down before him. Just as Psalm 95, you know, that I used to say in Sunday school, come, let us bow down, let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Whether it's physically kneeling, whether it's in our heart, but we're humbling ourselves because the God we believe in is our Father Almighty. It's a beautiful picture. We believe in God who is Father. And there's a couple of aspects to that. We, we can't go through everything today because we've got lunch coming, but we can, uh, <laughs> but we can, um, but we can just take a few of these aspects and you can take this little card away with you and, and, and meditate upon it, think upon it, because it's summarising who God is. But, but there's two aspects, the Father and the Son in the Trinity. God is God the Father, God the Son, and, and God the Holy Spirit. And in John 14, it says the Son loves the Father. And in John 3, the Father loves the Son. There's a beautiful relationship there that of God as Father is the community of the Trinity. But then we have a beautiful relationship with God as his children. He is our Father. He came to his own in John 1 and his own people did not receive him but to all who did receive him, to all who gave their lives to Jesus, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. Not of human lineage. We never come to have God as our father because of the family we were born in, because of our background. Not of human capacity. I could never achieve the righteousness of God myself. Not of human volition, but born of God. And the Holy Spirit enables us to be born into his family, to have God as our Father. And that's very precious. Over the years, 2 Corinthians 6 has been very precious to me. That uh, he says, it's in the context of don't be yoked together with those who don't believe. But he says, come out from among them and be separate. And I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. And you will be sons and daughters to me says the Lord Almighty. This is the amazing thing about our God, that he's almighty God, and yet he's our Father. Personal, a personal living relationship of love. Almighty God. God's the almighty king. In Psalm 93, the Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, enveloped in strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. It ought to be a great encouragement to us that we know God both as our Father but also as an almighty God, that nothing can get in the way of what God wants to do. And we can trust him. You know, I look back, uh, there are times I've, I've promised something to my children and didn't do it, or, or something came up, I got sick and I couldn't do it. But with God as our Father, when he promises us something, there's nothing that can come in the way of him doing it. There's nothing that can stop him wanting to do it. He's a beautiful heavenly Father and he's almighty God. You know, read the Psalms, Psalm 97. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. That's how almighty he is. Psalm 135, the Lord is great. The Lord is greater than all the gods. He does whatever he pleases. You know, when I uh, graduated uh, out of, there were about 35 of us, and uh, only about three of us got jobs here in Adelaide. It was a real downturn in the market. And uh, the Lord I didn't know what to do. I was looking around, applying to different places, and I was reading Jeremiah, Jeremiah 32. It became a precious promise to me. Lord God, you yourself made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. 
And I didn't know, I wasn't trying to put conditions on God, but God helped me through that passage to see that he's the almighty God. Nothing's too hard for him. And he does promise to meet our needs. Where we are, he will meet our needs. So when we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, don't just say those words, but believe. It says, I believe that he's the one for whom nothing is impossible. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, A writer called uh, J.I. Packer notes, God the creator parts company with anything that sees the world as part of God or God as part of the world. And now the son parts company with all sorts of religions that will not acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, King of Kings, fully human, but also fully God. Jesus, I believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus is his personal name and it means God is saviour. Whereas Christ is not really his surname, Christ is, uh, is his title. It's a bit like saying Christ Jesus, like saying King Jesus, the one who reigns, the one who was anointed. Just as in the Old Testament, we have the picture of the kings and the priests who were anointed with oil to establish their authority. So Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. In Romans 14, Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. And you, when we say his only son, our Lord, probably many of you will think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And sometimes it's helpful to see how these creeds developed because of the distortion of the truth that was happening. And so the, the, there was this group around at that time called the Gnostics, who believed in this sort of superior knowledge and that the body and physical, physical, you know, the physical body was sinful and you had to have this special knowledge. And so when, you know, when the church had to come to this truth, it, the Gnostics in one sense didn't worry so much that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. They were worried that he was born, that he actually became a real physical person and just like you and me Jesus had a human mother he had a time and a place where he was born he entered in to our human existence but then he wasn't like us in the sense that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit you know God had to say in Luke chapter 1 listen Mary you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. But he will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And Joseph, you know, quite rightly in a sense, was worried when he was going to marry Mary and she was pregnant. And, uh, and God had to say, what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you'll name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. We needed a human saviour in the sense of someone who could die the death we deserve to die. But we also needed a perfect sacrifice. Someone who didn't deserve to die, who could die in our place. And that's why Jesus had to come. Jesus the Son of God. He was crucified. They arrived at the place, in Luke 23, they arrived at the place called the skull and they crucified him there. Jesus actually died. He died the death 
that we deserve to die because of our sin. And he descended to the dead. Sometimes if you've come across the Apostles' Creed before, you will have seen that um, uh, it's descended into hell. And, uh, but we believe it should really be descended to the place of the dead because he truly died. He didn't actually descend into hell as the, as the sort of eternal punishment for sinners because he said on the cross, it is finished. The price has been paid. I, Jesus was our propitiation, the one who bore the wrath of God and totally satisfied the wrath of God upon the cross. So really we're saying he descended into the dead. He didn't just swoon on the cross. He really did die. And then God raised him up from the dead. On the third day, he rose again. As Colossians 1 says, the firstborn from the dead. God raised him up to demonstrate to us that God, there's nothing that's impossible for God. He is even the one who conquers death. And so we who once lived in fear of death all our lives can trust God that just as he raised Jesus up from the dead, he'll raise us up from the dead. He ascended into heaven. In Mark 16, the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Not only do we see in the resurrection, but the ascension, that Jesus had fully satisfied both the need for our, to die for our sin, but he'd fully satisfied and was pleasing to his heavenly father. And he'd fulfilled the whole purposes of his heavenly father and could go back and sit at the right hand of God the Father. In Mark 16, the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And uh, Hebrews chapter 1, after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so we are to keep our eyes on Jesus. In Hebrews 12 too, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We come to believe in Jesus, who is not dead. Jesus is alive. He's on the right hand of God, the Father. And we can pray to him. And, and he is in all authority. It ought to be just such an encouragement to us to believe this is the Jesus that we follow and that we worship, who's sitting in the highest place of authority. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. God, one day, is going to wrap up all history in Jesus. And uh, everything is going to be put right. We may not see some of the terrible things that are happening be put right now. But we can believe that God is the impartial judge who will put all things right. Well, that's Jesus. We believe a lot, really, but it's beautiful. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in a person, not just an influence. The Holy Spirit is a person. He can be grieved. Uh, it's, very, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing, though, that we can walk and live in the life of the Spirit. In Romans 8, 13... If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And there's always a danger that I remember a, a, a um, retired missionary telling me he felt this was one of the key problems of missionaries on the mission field as they faced difficult situations that never really learned to live by the Holy Spirit to depend upon the Holy Spirit, depend upon his strength, depend upon his wisdom. 
It's so easy to fall into the trap of trying to live the Christian life ourselves. And so when we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, it believe, it, I believe that he is my counsellor, he says in John 15, 26. He will testify about me. He'll help me. He'll lead me. He'll guide me. This, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. I believe in the Holy Spirit. In uh, Ephesians 5, 18, he says, Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. And when we become a Christian, we are baptised into the Spirit, into Christ, into the Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. We become a temple of the Holy Spirit. But then he says... Be filled. Another way of looking at that word is be controlled. Start to live under the control of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will then help you to live that life. So that it's no longer me trying my best. It's the Holy Spirit strengthening me, guiding me, leading me. He's a, a person to whom you can speak. The Holy Catholic Church. Don't get mixed up with the Roman Catholic Church. When they wrote the creed, they meant Catholic in the sense of the universal church, the worldwide church. And it's an amazing thing that here we are worshipping, gathering together to worship God, but there are little groups of people all over the world, some of them in very public places, other in very isolated places. I, I read recently of um, a man who was in the early days in mission work in the Yemen. He, he got a taxi and Yemen is a, basically a Muslim country, very closed country. And, uh, and he, uh, he got talking with the taxi driver and the taxi driver turned out to be a Christian. And, he, and the taxi driver said to him, you know, we're, we're an isolated little community up in the hills. We worship God and we trace our roots back to Thomas. Thomas, the apostle who dropped into Yemen on the way to India. The tradition has that Thomas ended up in India. And so here's this little group of believers up in such an isolated, closed country who are worshipping God. And that's what we believe. We believe we're not the only representation of the church. We're simply part of his body and that there are believers all over the world, underground, above ground, everywhere where that are worshipping God. And one day there's going to be people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation worshipping God in heaven. Isn't that a beautiful thing to think that we're part of that? That's the communion of the saints. As we saw in 1 Corinthians 10, there is one bread. Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body. From all sorts of different backgrounds, Jesus on the cross has brought us all together into one body. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said to a woman in Luke 7, 48, your sins are forgiven. And when we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, God wants us to know that that's a reality in my life, that my sins have been forgiven. In Colossians 2, 13, you were dead in the trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. See that little word, all. Not just, not just the ones I think are really bad, but everything. And, and remember, past, present and future. Even the sin tomorrow. Jesus died on the cross, otherwise... If I've got a struggle to be good, it becomes a work of salvation, a works salvation. But he has forgiven everything. He says there, he's erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us 
and opposed us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. There's a picture there of, you know, we were in prison and, and there was a, in those days they'd put this certificate on the prison door. You know, Harold did this, he did that, he did that. He can't be released until the penalty is paid. Until either the, he stole this money, until the money's paid back, he can't. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, he came and he erased that certificate. So there was no more sin there. The prison guard could no longer keep us there. But what's even more amazing, he not only removed all my sin, he gave me the righteousness of Christ. That still staggers me. Not only has he forgiven my sin, but he's given me his righteousness. And God the Father looks on me and sees his son. The forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. When I used to learn this, I, I used to, as a, as a child, I used to think, oh, well, yeah, that's fair enough. I believe in the resurrection. We had the story with the stone rolled away. Why did they have to say resurrection of the body? Well, again, that's why we have these creeds, because there were people who thought, you know, it's all about just being spiritual. And we're not really seeing that the Bible says when he saves us, he saves us both in our spirit, our soul, but he also saves us in our body. Yeah, right back in creation, he gave us a body. And when we become a Christian, we receive his promise that not only will he save us, forgive us our sins, but one day when Jesus returns, we'll have a new body. And uh, I can tell you, as you get older, you, you start to get more and more thankful that one day God is going to give you a new body. And it'll be a beautiful body. We're going to be looking at that in 1 Corinthians 15 when, when we get there. You, you know, uh, Paul had to write, uh, you know, to remind them that we do actually have, we're not just going to be floating as this sort of cloud. We're going to have, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and we will have a new body. I believe, not just in the resurrection, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Again, one of my favourite verses is John 10, 28 and 20, uh, 27, starting, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish, perish and no one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. And sometimes I'd feel really inadequate or think, oh, I've messed this up. And God says, no one can snatch you out of his hand. He holds on to you for eternity. Well, that's the Apostles' Creed. I hope it wasn't too heavy for you, but what I want to finish with is by saying, I, I think you ought to write your own creed. Not, I'm not talking about heresy, but, uh, but creeds were never meant to replace the Bible, simply to summarise the Bible and what we believe. And I was, I was talking about this with my wife uh, during the week. She's in kids, so I can talk about her. But, and every now and then we do talk. And uh, she, uh, she said that as uh, she said to me, well, as a young believer, uh, she would be reading through the Bible and, um, and she started to note verses about God as Father and God the Son and the Holy Spirit and, and about the cross and she'd put those verses in the back of a Bible. You know, some Bibles have those blank pages and uh, it, in a sense it almost became like her systematic theology. It, it became her creed because she, even though she'd grown up in a Christian home, she wanted to know where what she believed, where that was in the Bible. And I want you to know that anything we've said this morning, if you go home and look it up in the Bible just to check that what I've said is true, we won't be 
Don and I won't be offended at all. We'll actually be delighted that you would go home and check it out in the scriptures for yourself. And, and that's why on the back of it, I've just given you some ideas with, uh, of different references, but really we want everyone to start to come to grips with this is what we believe, but this is where it says that in the Bible so that we can all be equipped to answer questions. And someone can say to you, well, I, I don't believe that uh, Jesus uh, is, is, is God, or I, I don't believe. Well, you've got some verses that you can go to. And, and don't worry if you don't know the answer. You can always, a fellow helped me as a young Christian, he said, just say, I'll get back to you on that. And you, and you can go home and look it up. But that's where I think the creeds, I, I, I'm just, we're praying that this will be what we believe so that it helps to give us a real certainty about what we believe as we face different distortions of the truth coming in, which has been around forever. And that's going to come both from outside the church and from within the church in, in the days to come. Um, I don't always quote uh, John Calvin, but uh, I will this morning. Uh, doctrine is not an affair of the tongue, but of the life. It's not apprehended by the intellect and memory merely like other branches of learning. It's received only when it possesses the whole soul and finds its seat and habitation in the inmost recesses of the heart. So when we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, that sets me free to follow Jesus. To believe he's a father is such an encouragement to me. To believe he's God Almighty helps me to trust him in dark places. And so the Apostles' Creed. Take it home. Uh, you can memorise it. I, I fully recommend memorising it. And, uh, and, and take it as this is what I believe. And next week... We're going to look at the Nicene Creed. So we're, we're going to do a bit of review of what we believe, but also we need to know something of the history of the church and what God has been doing over the years.